methodological issues to let invite me to about how we interpret evidence. And I hope I'll be able to make some connections between what I've done and what some of the other speakers today have done. And essentially, what I'm going to do is start by looking at the image of a normal scene of childbirth in a moment, contrast it with a very well documented case of a royal birth, and then come back to the information I have from early modern France about non-royal, but probably still elite births. I should say at the outset, I'm looking primarily at printed evidence and print, so I haven't been in the archives as some of you have laboriously copying out um, all of the handwritten evidence, mm -hmm. but I think printed evidence does have other challenges uh, which I should highlight. And the reason why I'm talking about France, apart from the fact I've worked on it, is that just to say from early on when printed books start circulating, from about 1530 onwards, more treatises were published on obstetrics and women's health care in French than in any other European language. Quite a lot were translated into English, not all, which is why I thought it was useful to provide a modern English translation for contemporary readers. Um, but certainly France seems to be leading the field in printed advice. Whether it's leading the field in terms of practice is another question, and I'll touch on that as we go. So if I can have the first slide. Um, this is a print by Avon Bus, a Huguenot, uh, who was a printmaker and etcher in the 17th century. And this is the third in a series of six prints, which would have been produced not in a book, but circulated and people could buy them at the sets of prints. And it tells the story of a normal, but I would say elite family, and the young woman's journey from in the first print she would have had a marriage contract, Second print, her returning home with her husband. Third print, next event in a woman's life, she gives birth. It's a happy event because we then go on to the baptism, um, the visit to a wet nurse, and um, the return home. Um, sorry, the, um, her friends visiting her at home. So I'm stopped on this one because I think it lets us see how in print in Paris in the mid, early to mid 17th century, birth was recorded. I think it's an unusual image, and I don't think it entirely accords with what written sources say, so I'll be interested on some of your takes on it. It's by a man who probably hadn't seen a birth himself, but had read about it in books that were circulating. Um, most of the images of birth at this period would have been virgin and child, and they would have been very proper, or they would have been anatomical plates in medical works. So a number of things strike us here. Um, not least that we have verses underneath the image, um, and we have several things in the image itself I want to draw your attention to. Probably the thing that most arrested my attention when I first came across it was the presence of a man with a husband. So, were well, husbands normally present at births? Question mark, I'll say more about that. Um, this is a birth which is both ordered. It's a very orderly print, it has a happy outcome, and yet shows something of the degree of material confusion birth and its unpredictability bring. The man has taken off his hat and put on his indoor wig and cap, as a man would do. Um, the woman, who in all other respects, everything is very properly ordered, notice the very neatly well bandages, if you enlarge the picture at some point on Google, you can see that. But the woman has cast her shoes off, Sideways, so she's very quickly got on that bed. Did most women give birth in bed? Question mark. Well, in this case, she's on a birthing bed, a sort of trouble bed, and after delivery, we move to the comfortable bed. Um, we also have a fire going, that does seem to correspond to reality in every description I've got. Heating the birthing chamber seemed the major priority. The interest here what midwives think of that. The verses underneath, which were by an anonymous author, all of Boston's have verses underneath, suggest more of a crisis than the scene itself does. And I'll give you an English translation of these. Um, I think they also show the different time scales in which people are operating. Mother in labor says, alas, I can bear it no longer. The suffering which grips me weakens me completely. My body is dying, there is no cure for the pains I feel. So she doesn't know quite how near the end she is. Midwife, who is receiving the baby, madam, be patient, do not cry out in this way. It is finished, and I swear you are giving birth to a fine boy. Um, midwifery books always advise and tell the woman she's getting what she thinks she wants. She can't tell us a boy yet, but tell her so she makes a final push. Husband, who is looking for the 
top, but doesn't seem to be looking at what is happening. You know, he's looking away as far as he can. This news brings me relief. Now all my grief is wiped away. Come, my dear, be brave. Your suffering will soon be over. Then we have the last one, the woman praying, la devote. Now, I'm not even sure she's in the picture. I started by thinking it was this woman, but I now decide that this woman has actually got a hand there on the woman. The other two ladies here are holding her hand or under her armpits. This one, an elite woman, is giving instructions to the servant. So I think this may be another woman from the family, but Boss has just included verse written because very often you would have someone praying, and the woman praying says, in this painful labour to which no other torment can be compared, deliver her Lord and keep her safe in giving birth. So uh, the image in sense throws up a number of problems. Um, simply put, were fathers present at births, particularly when they were not emergencies? Um, would the woman normally have been on a bed in this period? Would we have had only one midwife? We had an interesting discussion earlier about midwives working in association. I'll suggest in more cases to where there's more than one midwife. And I think it's quite interesting that um, Boss, who is publishing for an elite, quite wealthy readership and um, owners of prints, has chosen to show this woman, covered up to here, so there is decency, but her feet are there. Pregnant and barefoot has a different meaning in the 17th century. You don't normally show the women's bare feet unless they're servants. So this seems to me an interestingly daring innovation in an otherwise very detailed print. I want to come on and compare it with another case, which is the birth by the Queen Mary de' Medici in 1601, which gave France the heir, the Dauphin, that they had been waiting for for a long time. Um, and I'm choosing this one up onto the next image, partly because we will have another boss image in due course, so we can see how he illustrates another birth in the event, but also because it's very well documented, and the documentation allows me to reflect on what printed sources tell us about what actually happened or what hypothetically might have happened. So to set the scene, we have Henry IV of France. France, um, he has not got a male heir. He's divorced his first wife, who had not borne any children. There had not been a male heir to the throne born to the king or the heir apparent since 1544. We're now in 1601. There have been a series of monarchies where the king had not had an heir or failed to produce an heir. There had been civil war. France is desperate for stability under Henry IV, the king most of all. So he marries a second time a young and above all new male bride, Marie de Medici from Italy, who is 26 when she's going to give birth in 1601. And I'll now move on to the next image. Um, this is one of the official celebrations of that birth in, I think, 1621 by Rubens, celebrating how Louis XIV, um, sorry, Louis XIII was born. So there's the mother, there's the child, allegorical figure of health with a snake over his arm, um, the goddess of fertility congratulating the queen. Nothing like reality, but this was painted 20 years after the event. And at a time when we wait for the royal birth in England, which I'm sure will dominate the newspapers, it's quite interesting seeing how the public celebrates such things. Um, but what are the written accounts? Um, we have four written accounts that I've come across which seem to me to have historical validity. Two are by historians, Pierre Lefort and Pierre Mathieu, neither were present but both were in Paris, and one by the doctor who became a pediatrician, one by the midwife who attended, and it's one of the first published works by a midwife, and is being translated for the Toronto series by colleagues of mine in America. So that would be a very interesting addition. And if I go on to the next slide, Pierre de l'Etoile gives a very short factual account of the birth. So you can see here's the date, the time, who gave birth and where, but we know nothing of the labour. Um, he spends most of his time writing a diary about events in Paris, reporting the celebrations in the capital. So that was his role as someone who was writing a journal, a sort of day-to-day -day diary of what happened. But if we move on to Pierre Mathieu, a historian of France, 
we have more details from a man, and this must be what he had been told afterwards and what publicly circulated. And I suspect this is rather similar to what we may read about Kate Middleton's birth. No daring details, but we have a slight sense we've been there. So Paine's ripped the Queen. The King and the Royal Princes were in the chamber according to the established law, in order those who might have a vested interest in succession would not say there had been cause for doubt. So this is perhaps the exception to the law where men must be present in order to make sure the Queen herself gives birth to an heir of her own body. So we'll see more about that in due course. A little bit of detail on the Queen's labour, um, partly that she was thought to be in great danger, she'd eaten too much fruit and suffered from what were thought to be colic pains that were actually the onset of labour. Um, and finally at 11 o'clock, sitting on a chair, she gave birth, more on a chair in a moment, so she doesn't give birth lying down. So from official histories, we do have a glimpse, but not as much as we get from those who were there. And we now move on to the report from two people who were there, um, well, two other people who were there in Rome, Marc Jean Edouard, one of the king's physicians, in fact, first royal physician, who kept a diary of the future king, Louis XIII's health throughout childhood. Um, I have to say again that Edouard did not intend his diary to be published. He kept it as a medical record for his own purposes, but also perhaps to circulate and share with other physicians. So it's a very scrupulous docu uh, document. As all life writing, it betrays a lot about the person writing it and their priorities, so I don't think it's neutral, but it wasn't written to be circulated to other people to defend himself, whereas a midwife writes after the event to be published and definitely wants to put forward a public image. Um, so we'll look at what Jean Edouard says, and we'll also look at what Louise Bourgeois says. But first, an account from Edouard to show, if I may have the next slide, um, the sort of things he records. His description of the child is more detailed than his description of the labour, because he is going to be physician to the child, and he will literally, every day of his and that child's life, record in the diary everything from the first sneeze to the moment when something momentous happens specifically. Um, I quite have a detail about um, his toes being clenched together from the big to the small toes on the clenched one's fist, so you've obviously close enough to see. Um, what I've done is compared the details given by Edouard in about two pages with Bourgeois in an account which is rather longer. So if I can go on to the next slide. This is Louise Bourgeois, midwife to the Queen, um, and also to elite, elite ladies in Paris, but also ordinary ladies in Paris. Definitely an urban midwife, utterly literate, married to a surgeon, networks within court circles. But at the point she delivers the Queen in 1601, she's only just become midwife to the Queen after rather a scramble for the position. So she's trying to make the stamp of her authority. She first publishes what she calls her observations on pregnancy, not recording the royal pregnancy, but others from 1609, which are rather like a midwife's case histories and reflections, I would say. 1617, she publishes a second set of studies, observations, and an account of what she calls the true account of the birth of the prince and princesses of France, in which by far the longest account is the birth of the king's heir, apparent, um, who will become Louis XIII. And by the time she publishes, he is Louis XIII. She is then a woman in her 50s whose popularity may be threatened either by the rise of other midwives or, and something I'll return to, the rise of male surgeons specialised in delivery. And we'll see some of this in the accounts. So I go to the next slide. Um, this is, these are the different accounts we have of what's happening at the birth. Edouard was very brief about what happened and simply records at the actual birth that the Queen was lifted from the bed where she had been lying. The lady took about 23 hours and she was having difficulties to be placed in a special birthing chair. It being believed she could be more easily delivered there. Now in the original French, the, she was um, placed in a special birthing chair is introduced with the pronoun on, one, someone placed her in that chair. And there are lots of references to one did this, someone um, tended her, on la pense, 
after she's given birth. This form is Louise Bourgeois, who is named by Herbois at the beginning, but scarcely deserves any mention. She's just one of the people in the birth chamber. And if I move on, Louise Bourgeois is, on the other hand, in her account, very concerned to defend her own territory. And she makes a point describing one of the Queen's late deliveries in 1607, the fourth child, which was a breach delivery and recognised to be such as child was coming, that never was Monsieur Honoré present. Monsieur Honoré is the, one of the new breed of surgeons specialising in delivering women in the case of difficult deliveries. And in the case of the breach delivery, the king had him called and standing in the antechamber in case he were needed because of his excellent reputation. But Louise Bourgeois is concerned to emphasize at this point that Honoré never entered the queen's chamber, either during or after the birth, in any of the queen's pregnancies. So the surgeon standing by it, had things gone wrong, the balance of power would change and the midwife would have had to stand back while the surgeon and physicians took over. Um, I'll talk more about Monsieur Honoré um, briefly, um, because it, what seems to me interesting in comparing a number of writings between about 1580 and 1620 is one senses that there was a sea change in at least elite Paris. I doubt this had got out to the provinces. I don't think it spread to classes that did not have the money to pay for Mr. Honoré's services. But he has mentioned, I've managed to establish his first name as Jean, but I need to do some archival work to find out more about him. But he's mentioned in a number of medical surgical works in passing, not always with antagonism by midwives, but Louis Bourgeois. Um, makes the point that over 25 years of her career, fashions have changed. And she says in 1617, giving advice to her daughter who is thinking of becoming a midwife, um, women's, women have changed in the way they approach birth. Monsieur Honoré could tell much about this. A mass of fashionable women say that in births, when the baby is presented normally, they much prefer him to deliver them than a woman. It's become the fashion at present. This bourgeois blames on the generally lax manners of the period and leaves us in no doubt as her to his taste. I blush for these women. Um, so we need to see that potentially on, someone like Honoré could be called in at any point. Now what I've done in the next series of slides is very briefly gone through and compared details from bourgeois and everyone else so you get a glimpse of how much they give you different information or whether they say the same thing. The essentials are the same, very few contradictions. So it's the same place. Key point for this present, we have an anti-chamber joining with 200 courtiers waiting to know what happens. The next slide. Um, let's see the sun where Louis XIII was born. Obviously now we arrange. Notice the fireplace, a good fire was burning throughout. Um, next slide, we see the length of the labour. So they're more or less in agreement. I think it depends when you start. Uh, when you think the lady started, and whether, like Edouard, you made the point that you had a very accurate watch, or whether, like Louis Bourgeois, you were relying on someone telling you the time. Um, the beds that we use. There was a large bed for the Queen to rest in afterwards, and a small bed for labour covered by a small awning, or a tent cover, and I'll come back to that. Edouard simply records that the Queen had a bed and a small bed for labouring. Um, but also in the work room was a birthing chair. And an interesting point, and I've mentioned this for a couple of you, and this is where I find it so useful to have midwife feedback. In the accounts by Bourgeois, the birthing chair is reserved for the Queen for the difficult labours. So if everything's going smoothly, the Queen may give birth supine on, the, on a smaller birthing bed. In case of difficult labours, she's encouraged to sit in the birthing chair, and this is where the heir to France came into the world. This is a chair from an earlier obstetric manual. The Queen's one was actually padded and upholstered, but still the same basic design. Um, now to a boss print of the scene, probably 1638, um, and this would have been published um, and circulated quite widely. I suspect he's taken the information from Bourgeois in order to draw his setting. But he's actually got a couple of details that are different from Bourgeois that I will mention in a moment. What we do notice is it's very chastely after the birth, queen in bed, rest 
resting, no bare feet. Midwife, and this is why I think he's drawn on Louis Bourgeois, bearing the baby triumphantly to the king, who is a long way away from the queen. The king will apparently play a different role in Edouard's version. Um, and there are the nobles of the court, sitting at a street distance away, but making sure there was no foul play. Now, where I think Boss has particularly departed from what Louis Bourgeois describes is in showing the awnings over the beds here as just two separate spaces. Um, in Louis Bourgeois' description, there was actually an outer tent over the majority of the room, with an inner tent inside the big tent with the small bed and the birthing chair. So it's quite important to imagine that very theatrical space for the delivery. Um, and if we move on, we'll see some of the things that they describe as present. And again, we'll see the difference in their perspectives, with Bourgeois giving far more detail. So everyone mentions the birthing chair, because that's where the future of the 30 comes into the world. Bourgeois is interested in other details, Note that the midwife will have a small seat for herself in front of the birthing chair, necessary for her to be in the right position to deliver the baby, but also meaning she's one of the only other people seated in the presence of the king. Um, the relics of St. Margaret remind me, when I'm looking at who's present at birth, that in Catholic France, and the majority of France is Catholic at this period, you may well find that there are people present who have religious persuasions, who are monks or nuns, you would have relics, um, and the religious dimension of childbirth shouldn't be underestimated. And then there are chairs with important people in court, but they're only really folding chairs and stools, they're brought in at the last moment. And if I go on to, these are the other things that were brought in, so the little details, Edouard gives more attention to things for the child. Bourgeois, once the child is born, that's less her domain. Uh, who else is present? Well, I divided them into main roles by the role accorded by the midwife or the doctor. Not surprising, the midwife might make herself the star, the physician makes himself the star. And they both have the same name people. So we've got three Clans du Saint, princes of the blood, and three very senior noble ladies. Only three, apparently, where she puts herself and her child at risk. So for him, there are going to be a number of people present, but it's primarily women who are assisting. Is that the case for other writers? Well, we have Juvel, <coughs> um, who wrote a book on women in labor and hermaphrodites. The two subjects do have a link, it's too long to explain here. Um, he was a, um, sorry, he was a physician in Rouen, so in northern France, in a fairly central urban setting. Um, one of the earliest supporters of cesareans on living women, because he says he'd seen successful ones, and that he has given advice on safe birthing. Some of it is perhaps more controversial, but he does talk about what will happen um, in delivery and talks about midwife warning family and friends who are in attendance if there's imminent danger. Again, advising the women press the lower abdomen if the labour is taking a long time. And a very interesting instruction, if the woman um, finds her labour easy and light or difficult and hard, it will be according to the exercise and movement she undertakes. And he wants her to walk around and um, exercise if she can. And then he says, if she does not have the strength to walk unaided, she may be supported under her arms by two strong women, one holding her on each side, and she may lean on them. So we've got, again, two women helping the woman to stay upright. Again, a woman who should press down on the abdomen if the baby is not coming with the speed the midwife would like. Or the woman may put her arms around another woman's neck while she's bearing down, and meanwhile, one of the midwives, so there's an assumption there might be more than one, will gently press the abdomen down. The other midwife, having lubricated her hands, will seek to dilate the opening. So you've got one matching delivery position and one helping to ease the delivery. Again, the instruction about using the sheet to raise the woman up during contractions. Well, this seems a fairly constant picture, and we don't have any reason to think that there are men present unless there is a difficult delivery. And here I have an illustration from earlier in the century of a cesarean on a living woman. Um, Rousseau wrote a 
treatises arguing it was possible, it was very controversial, a lot of people denied it. But when there's a caesarean, it's advised that it be men who are present as the assistants because women will probably not have the strength or the um, mental resistance to be able to withstand what is happening. So that's an unusual case. But I wanted to, I think, yeah, I can't speculate in a moment, but I wanted to take one last case from Leo, another of the physicians that I've translated, who wrote in 1582 a very popular work on women's health in which one chap one whole section of the work is on childbirth, both, both natural and, as they often put it in the period, against nature, so what we call assisted or difficult delivery. Um, Leopold's original text seems very much in accord with what I've said up till now, but it was revised in 1609 by another physician, Pinner, and the revisions are very helpfully in italics, and they're extensions to the work, so it becomes quite a lot longer, and the person who's revising it wants you to see his added in because he's put it in italic type, which is wonderful for comparison. And we begin to see the sea change that I'm observing from other evidence of men playing more of a role at birth. So Leobald had said, someone may give birth standing up, supported by several people, or resting their arms on the edge of the bed or on a bench. The best thing for a woman is to use a birthing chair um, rather than on a bed or another position. Leobald is a keen anatomist who's assisted at dissections and argues that this is the most satisfactory way of the pelvis opening. Pena, in amongst his additions, now seems to suppose that the husband or other men will be present. He goes back to the point that if the labour is somewhat delayed, it may help to apply pressure to the abdomen. And in 1609, in certain italics, the, um, the surgeon will be called and will instruct the husband or another person, brackets, it must be a man, to put his hand on the navel and push down with moderate force. And then he adds, very comforting little detail, in Egypt, two men, one on each side, take the woman's arms and apply pressure under her armpits, which has the power to push the fetus down. Now it's fashionable from about the 1570s, 80s onwards to make comparisons with how easy labor was in less civilized countries where women had active lives and just lay them naturally and the baby almost drops out. So I think that's the purpose of that particular tale. But it's interesting that men are suddenly playing a different role and the husband is present and may even assist in the delivery by putting his hand and pushing the baby down. The final thing I wanted to show you was the Spectrum Martricus, um, an early version of instruments that are still used as circular, I said, circular, sorry, like I said. Um, and this seems to have come into fashion at some point in about the 1570s or 80s in France and be used as an early aid in labours that were not progressing. And it's mentioned by several of the physicians I deal with were publishing from the 1580s onwards, particularly in the case of Monsieur Honoré, the surgeon expert in deliveries. And the information we get is that in difficult cases where the vagina won't um, expand sufficiently for the baby to be delivered, if the speculum is inserted, Mr. Honoré has managed to extract the child alive and save the mother's life. And Louis Bourgeois even mentions this as one case. But interestingly, the instruction or the use of the speculum specifies that it must be a man who holds a handle while the surgeon has his hands inside to extract the baby. The same instructions also say that the woman should be covered so that neither anyone in the room um, or the woman herself are embarrassed. So the assumption here is that the woman would not be seen, but she would have a man who has at least a hand there holding the speculum, while the expert surgeon, perhaps forerunner of the male midwife, extracts the baby. Um, going back to Adrian's point about mm -hmm. risk, my treatises make it very clear that in most cases delivery will be natural without um, having to have recourse to surgery. I think precisely because surgery was so feared and most of the instruments were fairly gruesome, um, so therefore there was a sense in which managing the labour without having recourse to surgery was the preferred option. 
But I think what we're seeing here is that this is a period in urban France, at least, for the elite, where fashions are changing, and surgeons may either be called into, are normally called in if a labor is completely arrested, and it is the only resolution, may be on standby as with Queen's breach delivery, or may simply be called in because some fashionable women would rather have a man deliver them. And there's just a hint of what Louis Bourgeois says, that this is part of women having become looser and freer and enjoying a man touching them. So it's just a slight <laughs> hint of, uh, because of what she says in the background about women's behaviour changing over the 20 years since she started practising, that this is part of a whole moral censure. But I think what I'm also finding here, and it's a subject I want to pursue, is that the evidence I'm having from written texts and from visual images has to be interrogated very closely. It serves the end of the person publishing it thought they were fulfilling. So Boss is producing prints for wide circulation in Paris, which are presenting something that people recognize, probably compare with their own experience, but which may be an idealized portrait. Um, the works themselves are often more interesting for what we read into the cracks and crevices where they don't think they're delivering information for 21st century researchers, rather than from what they originally did. So Louise Bourgeois' account of Royal Births seems to me very much what the tabloid newspapers would love to have when there's a royal delivery now. You know, everyone wants to know every detail. But actually, when I start reading her accounts and the physicians and surgeons' written accounts, I'm looking for the little things they slip in about people being present at births to try and build up a portrait of what happened, largely because, and this goes back to what we had in the talk about the archival records in rural areas, there are so few records by women or even by families of what happened at normal births. When I've worked on birthing tales, it's the unusual, the risk-ridden, of which grab the highlights. Normal births are less interesting after the event, um, unless a woman is perhaps talking orally to her friends. And so I'm having to look at written printed texts and images in order to reconstruct archaeologically the picture of what actually happened. Thank you.